I will start with our preamble uh, before uh, turning it over to our distinguished speaker today. Uh, I, my name is Laura Estel, and I am an Associate Professor of English and Canada Research Chair in Digital Humanities at St. Francis Xavier University. Today, I am speaking to you from Mi'kmaq, the ancient and ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and today's talk is the keynote for DHSI East. DHSI is the Digital Humanities Summer Institute, which was founded at the University of Victoria. And DHSI East is an effort to bring a small uh, DHSI community to Atlantic Canada. The DHSI East organizers this year were Margaret Vale, Megan Landry, Lydia Vermaiden, and Richard Cunningham, and myself. Our course this year, uh, our uh, workshop is on text and coding initiative by Dr. Emily Murphy and Constance Crompton. Um, and this has been made possible by the Canada Research Chairs and the St. FX Digital Humanities Center. I would like to let everyone know that our talk today is being recorded. We will have time for Q&A at the end, and at the end you can um, uh, raise your hand and we can unmute you, or you can put your questions into the Q&A box and I can read them out loud if you're not in a place where you're able to unmute yourself. With that, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ken Penner. Ken's quest to automate the translation of ancient texts began in the late 1980s while working on a computer science degree at Simon Fraser University. His first venture into digitizing ancient texts was the online critical pseudoepigrapha, which he started with Ian Scott and David Miller in 2002 as a grad student at McMaster. Ken was responsible for the technical aspects, programming and data structuring. For his doctoral dissertation, he built a database of all the verbs in the major Dead Sea Scrolls in order to identify correlations between their form and function. For Logos Bible software, he added lexical and morphological tags to the Greek words of two major ancient Jewish corpora, the pseudoepigrapha and the works of Josephus. From 2007 to 2010, sorry, to 2020, Ken produced a scholarly edition with translation and commentary on the Greek text of the prophet Isaiah as represented in the fourth century Codex Sinaiticus, published by Brill. In 2016, Ken produced an eclectic edition of the biblical Dead Sea Scrolls representing the oldest attested readings in the Qumran biblical texts. Since 2019, Ken has been co-editor of the book series, Digital Bi Biblical Studies, published by Brill Academic Publishers. And in 2020, he was elected to the board of directors of the Text Encoding Initiative, TEI, where he serves as secretary. And with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Penner for his talk today, which is titled, A Toolkit for Humanities Research and Editing Ancient Documents. Super, thanks, Laura, for all that. Now, all of us at university were involved in knowledge transformation, right? We're discovering the reality around us and making it intelligible to others. But the kind of knowledge we work with varies widely depending on our discipline and our specialty. We work with different kinds of data. Some of us rely on experiments, others on surveys, others on ideas, and others logical proofs. For those of us who study ideas from the ancient world, the data we work with are texts, the linguistic output of humans as recorded physically in writing. So it makes sense that access to our data, the, to the text, is essential to our work. But access to these texts is often hampered by barriers like geography, language, and even incomplete li library cataloging, for example. One of the most exciting developments in digital humanities I was going to say in recent years, but I suppose all years in digital humanities are recent, uh, is the push to reduce those barriers by making our data fair. Now, what do we mean by fair? Of course, we refer to a set of principles developed, well, published in 2016 first, to make data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I'm going to quote descriptions of these principles from the GoFair website. The first step in reusing data is to find them. Metadata and data should be easy to find for both humans and computers. Accessible, once the user finds the required data, he, she, or they need to know how they can be accessed, possibly including authentication and authorization. 
interoperable, the data usually need to be integrated with other data and they interoperate with applications or workflows for analysis, storage, and processing. And the ultimate goal of FAIR is to optimize the reuse of data. To achieve this, metadata and data need, should be well described so that they can be replicated and or combined in different settings. In this presentation, I want to address the possibilities for specifically the texts of ancient manuscripts, not only to make them FAIR, but to do so as efficiently as possible. The FAIR principles aren't entirely new to the new media age. Before the internet, let's think about how we used to make our data FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. How did we make what was recorded in the ancient manuscripts have these qualities? Let's remember some special considerations that apply when our data is ancient manuscripts. First, they're handwritten, meaning they require decipherment. They may have unconventional abbreviations or unconventional uses of space. Uh, second, they may be copied by copyists who are fallible. In fact, we can guarantee that they were copied by copyists who are fallible. They've made mistakes, sometimes even intentional changes. And third, they're in languages that we no longer speak and from cultures we're no longer or we aren't a part of. And an implication of these three features is that in order to maximize the usefulness of the ancient manuscripts, we want to not only transcribe what each of them has, but also identify and undo the mistakes the scribes have made over the centuries of recopying them. And then we'll want to translate them into modern languages and explain them to modern readers. So typically, before the new media age, scholars of ancient texts would produce outputs like the following. First, a transcription of the ancient manuscripts. So we see a transcription in this example. A transcription um, into standardized movable type formatted with spaces between words, uh, conventional spelling, punctuation, paragraph divisions, um, justified margins, even numbered chapters and verses uh, or line numbers on the side here. Uh, second, if the text was attested in more than one manuscript, a set of notes would be added to indicate where the manuscripts disagreed. And we have a whole critical apparatus, two of them here in fact, to indicate those disagreements among our manuscript witnesses. And they indicate which of the competing readings is judged by the editor to be authentic and which readings are a mistake or intentional change. Third, a translation of the standardized text would typically be made into the modern language of the edition. And finally, a set of comments would be added to justify the translation or explain its significance. This was typically the extent to which scholarly efforts on publishing editions of primary texts could go. Beyond that was the domain of those producing secondary literature on the topic. Now, before the internet, it used to be that to make texts findable, they had to be published in library card catalogs, uh, bookseller catalogs, or published indexes. And it used to be that to make texts accessible, they had to be printed and distributed to bookstores and libraries. It used to be that interoperability was something that only a human could do. They could produce a derivative work such as a concordance or lexicon. And that reusability was next to impossible. In other words, it used to be that scholars working on text did so by huge investments of labor and other resources. But in the age of new media, the possibilities are blown open. Libraries holding ancient manuscripts have started photographing manuscripts and posting their images online. But even that only takes us so far. What I want to do in this presentation is first describe the typical tasks in producing a full set of conventional scholarly outputs for an ancient text, so that I can secondly describe how a set of digital tools can provide two advantages. One, by greatly reducing the tedium and duplication of effort needed to make ancient texts findable and accessible, 
even in their conventional print forms, and to, to make these scholarly outputs interoperable and reusable, available as input for new research in ways impossible for conventional print output. And finally, I'll end this talk with an invitation for those of you who want to be part of this revolution to join up in collaborative cooperation. So what I want to do first is outline the phases of digitizing ancient texts in the typical workflow from digital images to commentary. And I'll illustrate each of these phases from three of my experiences that Dr. Esto pointed out in the introduction um, that used such a workflow recently. Experiences that have been hybrids to various degrees of the conventional tasks on one hand, combined with some digital assistance on the other hand. As uh, Dr. Estel mentioned, my first venture into digitizing ancient texts was the online critical pseudepigrapha, which was on the screen there, which Ian Scott, David Miller, and I started in 2002 as grad students at McMaster University. And Ian and I remain co-editors or co-directors of this project, and it's publicly open at pseudepigrapha.org. My second venture was with Logos Bible Software to add metadata to their texts of the Bible and parabiblical literature. So the morphological tagging of the pseudepigrapha and Josephus, an eclectic edition of the text of the biblical Dead Sea Scrolls, an interlinear alignment for the Old Greek Bible, the Septuagint, a translation of the Hebrew and Old Greek Bibles, and a set of intertextual allusions between parabiblical texts and the Bible. My final relevant venture is producing the commentaries on the ancient Greek texts of the book of Isaiah in the manuscripts Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Marchalianus. These are conventional commentaries with conventional aims. Uh, you see the, um, a page of translation with a textual apparatus, a page of, sorry, transcription of textual apparatus, translation with uh, allusions and uh, echoes where those texts were reused in, by ancient authors, and then commentaries that describe uh, why I translated the way I did and uh, some of the significant or peculiarities of this Greek text. So the first of the workflow phases for such a print publication is to establish conventions on how to reference the text. For the online critical pseudepigrapha, we delimited the corpus that we called pseudepigrapha. It's a collection of dozens of uh, individual texts. Uh, we decided how to reference each work in this corpus by including all the works listed in the standard uh, print collection by James Charlesworth, called, entitled Old Testament pseudepigrapha. And uh, we decided to refer to them using the abbreviations and divisions described in the style guide uh, by the Society of Biblical Literature, their handbook of style second edition. The witnesses to those ancient works may exist in the form of manuscripts or printed editions. So for the OCP, we identified the standard printed editions of the texts and conferred with the standard printed reference bibliographies of this corpus. For the Codex Sinaiticus, uh, parts of the manuscript are scattered among three European libraries, but the photographs have been collected at the site codexsinaiticus.org. When working for manuscript photographs, as with the Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Marchalianus, we need an index of the range of text represented on each photo of each witness to identify the appropriate photos for each section of text. And that's because ideally a text will be transcribed from its primary source, the manuscript, rather than from an edition. However, for the first few texts of the online critical pseudepigrapha that we put online, we type them from printed editions, not from manuscripts. They were hand keyed in ancient Greek as Unicode XML files and were marked up with variant readings also hand keyed on the basis of the textual apparatus of the printed editions. Because the OCP transcriptions were for printed editions, standard spelling and punctuation were used. But when the witnesses include manuscripts, the transcriptions don't always follow standard orthography spelling. So for my Isaiah commentary on Codex Sinaiticus, I started from a TEI XML diplomatic transcription, that is, a transcription that reproduces the spelling and layout of the original. 
that was available on the Codex Sinaiticus website. I then wrote automated scripts to help normalize the spelling, accents, and punctuation to follow modern ed editorial conventions. Now, to this point, we've been following a workflow that's applicable for print resources. Yet when publishing digital texts, we can add metadata to extend the usefulness of the text far beyond us. The Codex Sinaiticus website maps each transcribed word's location on the manuscript image. This is a step that only applies to digital editions and doesn't need to take place before the next phases of the workflow that I'll describe. That is, once a normalized transcription of each witness is in place, the textual readings of the various witnesses can be compared. So for the Isaiah commentary, I created an apparatus of textual variants, which I then included below the transcription of the Greek text of Isaiah, as I showed you. And this kind of collation is the basis for establishing a critical eclectic text. Uh, that's a mix of uh, the evidence in various manuscripts. So when I produced the eclectic edition of the biblical Dead Sea Scrolls, I was representing the oldest attested readings in the Qumran biblical scrolls. And I did the programming to choose the best reading and calculate the state of preservation of each letter based on existing manuscript transcriptions. Following the lead of the Collate X tool, Thread will have the ability to generate the best eclectic text on the basis of criteria the user specified. Adding linguistic metadata to each word can make more complex searches possible. For example, I used Logos Bible Software's morphological tagging tool to add lexical and morphological tags to the pseudepigrapha in a process that combined an automated parser to identify the possible lexical forms and inflections for each word, and a tool for a human to curate these computer-generated parsings to choose the correct lexical form and morphology for each word in its context. And the result is that we can now search the pseudepigrapha or Josephus's writings for all the instances of a particular dictionary form in any inflection, for example, where the verb to be appears or where it appears in the past tense. To produce the interlinear version of the Septuagint for Logos Bible software, so it's got the original language text in one line and below that uh, what each of those um, Greek words um, what their lexical form is, what their morphological information is, and what English gloss uh, corresponds to each of those words. And I used their tool that they produced to show each Greek word in the text along with its lexical form and parsing and uh, suggests a, a contextually appropriate English gloss. And then me as the human editor would select or adjust the gloss as needed, the translation as needed, and record the sequence in which those uh, translated words would need to be read in order to make sense in English. Then to produce my English translation of Isaiah, I wrote scripts to automatically rearrange the English contextual glosses from the interlinear data I just mentioned. And it produced a rough graph translation of Isaiah, which I then edited into a smoother translation. For several Bible translations into English and French, I worked for Logos Bible Software to use a computer tool to specify which Hebrew and Greek words corresponded to the words in the French and English translations. This linking then allows searching for which ancient word gets translated to a specific modern word or vice versa. And again, for Logos Bible software, I designed criteria to classify the biblical quotations, citations, allusions, echoes, and verbal parallels found in the pseudepigrapha, Dead Sea Scrolls, and the works of Philo of Alexandria for Logos Bible Software's ancient literature data set. So a computer program was used to identify possible connections, and then a human subsequently rejected or confirmed and sorted the inter intertextual connections by type of connection. And when I wrote the commentaries on the Greek text of Isaiah as found in the manuscript Sinaiticus and Marshallianus, I added explanations about the peculiar aspects of the text. Now, the published results of my work in the commentary fell into those five categories, the Greek text, the variance among the witnesses, the English translation, the references to how this text was used by ancient writers, and the commentary. And those were combined into a standard printed book, for which, by the way, Brill is charging 239 US dollars. 
we're looking for something a little more findable, accessible, and uh, specifically accessible in this project. So I mentioned that commentary on Greek Isaiah, not only because it followed the typical workflow for creating scholarly editions from manuscript images all the way through transcription, normal, normal, normalization, apparatus of variance, translation, and commentary. I mention it, yes, because it follows a typical workflow, but also because of the inspiration it provided. When uh, Ian Scott and I established the online critical pseudepigrapha, we, we started to recognize the need for a set of software components that are standards compliant, modular, maintainable, easily deployable, and readily usable by content specialists who aren't necessarily computer specialists. Now, this is in 2002 that we started this. And since then, and already then at that point, some tools existed, but now many tools do already exist to produce and publish digital editions of texts, as well as mark them up so they can be used as the basis for further research. And many of them are even free. But the problem is that often the scholars seeking to produce these digital texts find the available tools difficult to use together because they were developed for a specific project or a specific text and therefore lacked the flexibility or generalizability to be used for other texts. And the result is that we've been look, working in isolated, we might call them silos, wastefully using our limited resources to repeat much of the development work that's already been done. So, I believe our research can advance much more productively if we work together to develop and share tools that are flexible and reusable. So not just reusable data, but reusable tools, tools that work together easily across different projects and corpora of texts. To produce such a unified tool set for a comprehensive workflow appropriate for all kinds of ancient texts, we would need to do three things. One, we need to unify the existing tools by adapting them to communicate with one another. Two, we need to design and code new tools for those steps of the workflow, those phases that are not yet well supported. And three, we need to provide for both computer automated processing and human editing at two levels. There's crowdsourcing by people who aren't necessarily experts. There's curation of that human and computer generated data by experts. Any given project need not follow all the steps of the complete workflow, but an ideal solution would be a platform to support such a unified workflow that encompasses the whole range of operations involved in producing and publishing ancient texts. To maximize its usefulness, such a platform would need to be publicized across the spectrum of humanities disciplines that process ancient texts. And the net result should be that scholars of antiquity are able to do more work more easily on the ancient texts we find so fascinating. Now, does this sound exciting and inspiring to you? If so, you'll want to take note. We are already organizing a group of designers, text digitizers, and programmers to develop such a free, unified set of tools for digital work on ancient texts. This comprehensive online collaborative platform is called the Toolkit for Humanities Research and Editing Ancient Documents. There was a spoiler in the title of the talk, right? Now, the acronym THREAD is intended to evoke both connectedness with texts as woven fabrics and this toolkit sewing them together and sequence where the workflow is stringing one step into the next. The end goal is a comprehensive platform for digital humanities textual scholarship in general, a platform that can empower all kinds of digital human humanities text projects in Canada and around the world. Now let's talk a little bit about the design of this platform. Uh, the theoretical basis for digital scholarly editions was discussed by Gabler in 2010 already. Um, it's been developed uh, by Peter Robinson, whose work has been most influential for this project. And more recently, many of the issues, both theoretical and practical, regarding digital editions have been discussed in a helpful collection of articles edited by Pierazzo and Driscoll. 
the practical methodology for most of the initial stages of the project follows that laid out by Troy Griffiths in his 2018 doctoral dissertation at the University of Birmingham. Griffiths' work has been used for such major projects as the Coptic Sahidic Old Testament project, the Avestan Digital Archive, and the, especially the Editio Mayor of the New Testament. His dissertation covers crowdsourcing and curating witness image reference range metadata, human transcription of witnesses, transcription normalization, and automated collation. Now, Griffith sets out a reliable way for tasks requiring a human operator to be crowdsourced and then curated by an expert. Similarly, he describes how tasks that can be partially performed in a preliminary way automatically by algorithm may then be verified or cleaned up by a human. In other words, what this means is that for each of the phases of the workflow, there must be two stages. So the first is the automatic machine processing that the computer can do, and the other is the correction or curation of the data produced by the algorithm. To illustrate, I expect many of you are familiar with the process of optical character recognition, OCR. Um, software such as um, Abbey Fine Reader or Tesseract can make its best guesses at transcribing a page image into characters. And we're happy when it achieves an accuracy of maybe 97%. But the best OCR software also allows the human user to correct the transcription. In fact, the best OCR software lets the user train the software to do even better next time. What I'm about to give next is my co-director Ian Scott's rationale for the technical design behind Thread's interoperability. If we want to support this workflow with a more reusable, maintainable ecosystem of tools, we suggest that we should move in the opposite direction from many previous projects. Instead of integrating them tightly, we propose breaking the tools for various parts of the workflow apart into discrete modules each doing its one task well, without knowing or caring how the other modules do their jobs. Individual tools can then be rewritten, replaced, or added without changing other modules in the system. User interfaces can be updated without changing backend service modules. Such tools would be like a diverse team of experts, each working independently within her specialty, but making a specific contribution that other team members can rely on. Therefore, a thread will consist of a set of independent but interoperable software modules, each of which performs a specific task. The question that is key is what common language can these experts use to share the results? Individual tools might be written in different programming languages, using different frameworks, maintain, maintained by different projects, how can they still cooperate as modules in an integrated workflow? The answer lies in the standardization of output for each stage. This is the key to interoperability among tools that can be applied to any text. Each module at each phase of the workflow can be used by itself, but it also has the ability to import and export the text formatted, formatted according to international standards. Now, the only really universal mode of communication for programs today is the HTTP protocol. That's what we use when we type a URL in, into a web browser's address bar and press enter, sending a message with a standard format to the server identified by the first part of the URL. Every computing technology today can send exchange requests to a web server and process responses using HTTP. These requests can carry small bits of information at the end of the URL itself as query parameters and can include a text file as the request body. A very wide variety of tools and interfaces can communicate like integrated modules via HTTP requests that include XML or JSON in the request body. So examples of those, uh, XML, there's a XML snippet following some TEI standards and then some JSON uh, link data uh, example. There are several existing standards that provide most of the vocabulary our modules will need. The Text Encoding Initiative 
or TEI, is a rich and flexible XML standard that offers robust ways to identify everything from textual variants to manuscript emendations. TEI is the de facto standard for sharing documents and extracts from documents as XML. The other non-textual metadata is best sent as JSON-LD. These established vocabularies will give us most of the labels we need for our modules to share JSON-LD information about ancient documents meaningfully. The HTTP protocol transmitting TEI and JSON-LD encoded data provide the foundation for a web API or application programming interface. Much of the internet has agreed on a set of design principles for APIs that we refer to as REST, R-E-S-T. Especially helpful is the Hydra standard for using JSON-LD to build web APIs that programs can understand without human help. On top of these two standards, a recent working group has built the Distributed Text Services Specification. This is a series of standards for APIs that handle ancient documents, sharing readable documents as TEI compliant XML and of all other data as JSON-LD. What DTS allows us to do is build generic client programs that interact with any server supporting the standard. Rather than every project needing its own reader interface, one reader interface can connect to any DTS compliant server and browse its collection. Therefore, in order for, to take advantage of the interoperability these standards enable, each thread module will be accessible through a standard web services API, allowing them to work together as a single software suite. In some cases, a module will simply be a wrapper around existing tools, which will allow them to talk to one another. Given the requirements of the standard workflow and the design specifications just outlined, let's consider what the tools at each phase of the workflow would need to do. Works that are processed through thread will be assigned to a corpus. For example, for the OCP, we delimited the corpus called Pseudepigrapha, um, as I described earlier. Because the thread platform is capable of scaling far beyond the biblical and parabiblical literature, it'll include a mechanism for specifying which works constitute a corpus and support multiple referencing systems so that it will, for example, simultaneously suppose both or support both referencing systems for Josephus, uh, Whiston's uh, system of, of numbering verses and Nisi's system of numbering sections. The next phase in the workflow is locating the witnesses to the works. The witnesses are those, or sorry, they're typically in manuscript or form or printed edition form. Thread will allow information on witnesses to be crowdsourced with that crowdsourced information then curated by the works editor and automatically added to a digital bibliography accessible through Zotero. Thread provides functionality for users to attach, upload, or link to photos of the witnesses and to add metadata to each photo uh, that is added that indicates the range of text represented on that image. So the appropriate image can be pulled up when transcribing the text. Ideally, a text will be transcribed from its primary source, the manuscript, rather than from an edition. And Thread currently allows for hand keying also of ancient and modern languages as TEI XML files. It will also incorporate optical character recognition and handwritten text recognition, which would then also be curated by the human editor. In the thread tool set, the transcriptions will be recorded as they are spelled on the witnesses so as to avoid losing information, for example, in case one wants to find patterns regarding spelling practices. But we also recognize that additionally, standardized spellings are needed to help with searching and other text processing. This wasn't an issue with the online critical pseudepigrapha transcriptions because we made those from printed editions. So standard spelling and punctuation were already being used. But if our witnesses are manuscripts, the transcriptions won't always follow standard orthography and spelling standards. Thread will include functionality to help normalize the spelling accents and punctuation to follow modern editorial conventions. 
Following the example of this Codex Sinaiticus website, Thread will also provide the tools to map each transcribed word's location on the manuscript image. This is an optional step that doesn't need to take place before the next phases of the workflow. Once the transcriptions of all the witnesses containing the work are normalized, Thread provides collation functions to identify patterns of textual variants. And this kind of collation is the basis for establishing a critical eclectic text. Following the example of the Collatex tool and the Center for New Testament Restoration, Thread will have the ability to generate the best eclectic text on the basis of criteria the user specifies. For biblical texts, linguistic metadata has been available for years through dedicated Bible software to search the original language, biblical texts, lemmas, and inflections. For example, for instance, automatic parsers are available into which one can feed inflected Greek words to identify the possible lexical forms and morphology for each word. Following the model of Logos Bible Software's morphological tagging tool, Thread will include both such an automated parser to identify the possible lexical forms and morphology for each word, and a tool for a human to curate these computer-generated parsings to choose the correct lexical form and morphology for the word in its context. Similar tools combining automated suggestions and human curation will enable syntactical um, functions of a similar nature, as well as semantic metadata to be added. So these will indicate the function each word is playing in its clause and sentence and the meaning of the voca vocabulary, including glosses in various languages. Thread will provide a tool that appears in interlinear form in which each ancient language word in the text along with its lemma and morphology and a contextually appropriate gloss in the modern translation target language. The human editor adjusts the gloss as needed and indicates the sequence in which these glosses would be need, need to be read in order to make sense in the modern language. The process of translating into modern languages will therefore be sped up by automation provided by Thread. The Thread workflow will include a phase in which translations can be drafted on the basis of the word order tagged in the preceding phase and then edited manually. Once the translation's in place, a computer tool can be used to specify which ancient words correspond to the modern words in translation. That kind of alignment functionality is also planned for Thread. This linking then provides the data needed to provide a reverse interlinear text. Using existing tools that identify potential similarities in wordings and lexical semantics, we envision that Thread will have the ability to suggest such intertextual connections as well, and to manually classify as quotations, citations, allusions, echoes, or verbal parallels. Other free and open tools for higher level textual analysis will be incorporated as appropriate, and users will be able to store their own annotations privately. Ultimately, Thread aims to bring together the many of the tools needed to produce a commentary on any ancient text, including discussion of the issues arising from the text critical, grammatical, linguistic, literary, social, whatever peculiarities of the work. Once the data has been collected and refined in all these ways that combine automated and human contributions, users will want to generate a wide variety of outputs, including searching, screen display, and print-ready files. And many tools already exist to display TEI text statically in visually appealing ways for the reader. Some even produce conventional print editions of ancient texts. Thread will adapt several of these tools to meet the needs of the publishing industry. These static results typically include a diplomatic transcription, a normalized transcription, and linguistic annotated text but these can be considered simply the data for the output. A digital presentation can be far more flexible than that. And that's because the text will be marked up with translation alignments, semantics, syntax, lexis, and morphology. So unprecedented searching capabilities are possible. Because the text will be marked up with syntactical boundaries, the witnesses for each reading and the image coordinates for each word on each witness Search results can range from showing keywords in the context of their exact phrase 
concordance style, to showing images of a specified letter from the witnesses, if you're teaching paleography, for example. It'll be possible to generate visual, visual outputs, such as graphs of frequency and distribution. For example, a paleography teacher could search for all examples of the letter A to show the range of, sh uh, of shapes. Lexical items could be searched, as well as constructions such as when the subject follows rather than precedes the verb in its clause. The text would be susceptible to various other textual analyses. Finally, traditionalists could produce a PDF of the text with a critical apparatus that they can customize themselves, selecting which witnesses to include and how to group them. Users can add their own annotations and either keep them private or make them visible to other users. What I've been describing is a platform that is here already, but it's not yet fully realized. The functionality that is currently in place already consists of those modules collected by Troy Griffiths and implemented in the VMR CRE platform, Virtual Manuscript Room Collaborative Research Environment. That's what that stands for. And this includes crowdsourcing and curating witness image reference range metadata, human transcription of witnesses, transcription normalization, and automated collation of variants. But to grow thread into all that it can be, we could use the expertise of two broad categories of collaborators, editors and programmers. The thread model envisions a team of editors organized into two dimensions. I like to call them nouns and verbs. The nouns are the corpora of texts. The, the verbs are the phases of the workflow. Each corpus of works has its own editor who can oversee and make decisions about the workflow from beginning to end. There would be someone responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls, another for the works of Josephus, uh, of Augustine, uh, Shakespeare, the Mahabharata, Beowulf, the Latin ophthalmological texts. So this person, the corpus editor, would know, for example, the differing referencing systems that are needed for that corpus, for Josephus or for the Dead Sea Scrolls, who knows the standard reference works in the bibliography and knows who to ask about anything that requires even more subject expertise. Those are the corpus editors. They're the policy makers, distinct from the work editors whose job it is to produce the research output by adding value to the text through markup and curation of machine output. The phase editors are those that are responsible for the tool in one specific phase of the workflow. They may need to adapt the tool to match the needs of the various corpus editors for example, they might need to add the capability of handling right to left scripts for those texts that are in Hebrew or Aramaic or Arabic. Or they might need to flag the need to revise the wrapper when a new version of the tool is released with a different API specification. Or if a new tool is created that meets the needs of that phase better. And programmers. The phase editors don't need to do the actual coding. The programmers can take care of that. Programmers might need to add wrappers to adapt API calls to the tools available. They might need to translate code from one language to another, and they might need to create new tools where gaps exist in uh, tools that have been already developed. Now, if you're hearing this and realize this vision would be a great way to combine our efforts to produce something more than the sum of its parts, here's the part you're waiting for. We are closer than ever before to a world in which our efforts in creating and publishing electronic texts can be truly cooperative and synergistic, in which technology will no longer be a barrier for subject specialists, but will be accessible and usable enough to spur new lines of research. And we hope that some of you may decide to join us in Thread to make it happen. We're gathering a team under the Thread umbrella and have established a GitHub repository as a focal point for our ongoing work and as an information hub. So what can you do? 
three things, volunteer, nominate, and promote. In order for the THREAD project to fulfill its promise, it needs to foster collaboration, not by an assimilation that prevents independent development, but by interoperability via those APIs that allow connection and repurposing. The first step in making this happen is to identify the existing tools that will work with our workflow in each of its phases and select the most appropriate one for inclusion in our workflow, or maybe a couple of different options assuming that the tool is available with a license that permits such inclusion. Once such an inventory is in place, uh, which we have developed already on our GitHub site, but it's already becoming outdated as more tools are developed worldwide. We appreciate nominations of open software that can be incorporated into this workflow. The second thing is to determine what needs to be adapted in order to, uh, to work with thread in each phase. What needs to be adapted to interface with the existing tool? Does it have an API to receive input? Does it have an API to return results? If yes, does the format of our, our data need to be transformed to its standards or does its output need to be transformed to our standards? If it doesn't have an API, will we need to copy its source code to the thread servers? assuming its license permits this, or can we implement its algorithm locally? Again, assuming permission by the license. We appreciate your help in evaluating the candidates for the thread workflow. For those phases in which there is no existing tool, such tools will need to be written. Using web APIs and URL parameters for inter-module communication will mean, among other things, that an instance of a module running on one project server could be made available for seamless use by other projects as well. It also means that each module can be written using whatever languages or technologies the developers prefer. We need people to design and code the software. Even if you're not an experienced coder, you can be part of the software testing process. With these various programmers, it's advantageous to have people responsible for maintaining consistency across the whole workflow in the following areas, visual appearance and user experience, data management, API standardization and documentation. User interfaces will be developed separately from the backend modules so that they can be easily customized and updated. If you have expertise in any of these areas, we would love to work with you. Any given project will not necessarily use many of these functions, but the whole, the goal is to provide a unified workflow that encompasses the whole range of tasks involved in producing and publishing ancient texts. The promise of the thread platform is for all of us who work on ancient texts to do our work more efficiently with less redundancy and waste. And I'll conclude by noting that the effort we humanists put into researching and editing one ancient document can benefit not only researchers in, researchers in our narrow field, but those in any part of the broad discipline, if we work together to transform knowledge by making it findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Thanks. Thank you so much. Let me applaud on behalf of our audience. Um, that was a fantastic talk. So uh, for folks who are in attendance, as a reminder, this talk is being recorded. If you uh, have questions now, we open the floor. You can raise your hand using the raise hand function at the bottom of the screen, or you can type a question into the Q&A box and we will uh, read it and answer it there. Um, we're seeing some applause and thanks in the chat as well. Um, this is, this is fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to start and use my chair's prerogative uh, to ask the first question as folks are typing or finding buttons. Um, and I was wondering uh, how, <clears throat> if you've ever done any work with these kinds of tools in the classroom, or how you've uh, uh, leveraged this for, for teaching somehow, because sometimes 
the research we do, and I can especially imagine working with ancient documents in languages we don't speak, like you mentioned with sometimes paleography challenges. Um, how do we uh, help get students engaged in this kind of actual research and work? Well, I haven't, I'd love to do that in classrooms. I haven't, uh, haven't got to the point in the courses that I teach where I have enough students um, competent in the ancient languages to do this kind of work on uh, languages that require um, to learning new scripts, for example. So I have uh, my research assistances where I've um, been able to, to train my uh, undergraduate students to help, but it's usually only one or two students at a time. That, uh, so nothing that I could bring into the classroom, though I'd love to be in that situation. Makes sense. Um, and even as someone who works on English documents, there are huge hurdles when we're going back with scripts that are not familiar um, and strange orthographies. And I am only going to the 17th century. <laughs> um, uh, there's a comment in the chat from uh, uh, Constance Crompton that she found the talk really accessible both on the uh, technical front and the introduction to ancient manuscript front, which is a double header. Nice, especially coming from her. Absolutely. Um, Josh McFadden asks in the chat, uh, uh, who he notes that this is outside his area, but he was wondering about the different types of publics who are using or will be interested in using Thread and the other tools. Different types of publics. Maybe I could use some clarification on what you mean by that. So the kind of people that would use Thread are probably those who are, well, they have some competence in the ancient languages already, which would tend to restrict them to academics. For the most part, ancient languages require specialized knowledge of, um, of languages. Um, however, I know there has been crowdsourcing of transcriptions um, of some Hebrew manuscripts, for example, um, where people don't need to actually know the script. They just, all they need to do in order to transcribe something is to choose which of the possible characters, maybe characters match each of the visual images. And he adds, he's wondering um, about scripture enthusiasts as well. Is it, does this have an application um, both beyond the academy? We're pretty sold on the academic application. Yeah, so does have an application beyond the category. I think the results of what Thread can produce would be uh, accessible to scripture enthusiasts, for example, the kinds of commentaries and uh, searches that might be possible uh, would be helpful, uh, especially when, when you get to the point of the um, translations linked to the original language words. And you can see, you know, where else is this? English word from the translation of this ancient document, uh, where else is, or so what's the original language word behind that? And where else is that word being used? So those would be tools that could be uh, made available public facing so that people can take advantage of the results of the academic work. Nice. Um, I'm going to read a question from the Q&A and then we'll unmute Harvey followed by Richard. Um, in the Q&A, Adam asks, you mentioned IIIF. Will Thread be employing LOD linked open data standards like URIs for RDF triple statements? Also, what kind of version control is in place for the ongoing addition of the different data sets? So for the data sets, we're using GitHub. So we just push the XML to uh, you know, using Git. Uh, so that was I'm kind of working backwards here. Uh, before that, you asked about um, uh, triple IF. IF, yes. URIs and uh, uh, RDF triples, linked open data question. Yeah, um, so uh, Ian Scott would be the guy to handle the uh, more of the API uh, questions on that. So I'm going to leave RDF out of my answer. But yes, we uh, already have uh, triple IF 
is um, is used in 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 the version of thread that we have already in operation. Um, well, I can. I was going to say, can I bring that in? No, I'm going to put up an image here that was brought in by Triple I F. Uh, this is a Greek manuscript of uh, Codex Martialianus that was brought in from because the Vatican Library had it digitized and available through Triple I F. And for those of you who don't uh, know IIIF, it's the International Image Interoperability Framework. And it is one of those international standards that Ken has been talking about throughout his talk. Um, okay, Harvey, can you unmute yourself? I think that Jim has unmuted you. Great. Oh, still a muted microphone. Oh yeah, you might need to click the unmute. Okay, is that, is that a little better? Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, really great talk today, and I really appreciated it. And I, I wanted to ask a question about um, licensing, in in particular, how you might license your stuff. But also, um, I work in in periods more recent even than Laura. But one of the places where scanning and OCR is difficult is in newspapers, um, even going back to 18th century newspapers. Um, and I've had some occasion recently to work with the uh, Gale Digital Scholars uh, uh, thing. And, and Gale, of course, is uh, a giant service provided to libraries, typically uh, quite expensive. Because they have really, really deep pockets, they can go in and scan all of these newspapers and they can OCR them. The OCR confidence is, is awful. It's, you know, maybe 30%, maybe, Ooh. maybe. Um, and what's interesting about it, though, is that the tools that they provide, they can do topic modeling, but they use Mallet, which is an open source tool. They can do sentiment analysis, which is um, Vader, which is also an open source tool. So my question really has <laughs> two parts, I guess. One is, um, are you worried about stepping on the toe? Ah, that's not even the right word. I don't care if it's just on stuff on Miguel's toes. I don't care. Are you worried about getting into some sort of a conflict with somebody like Gail? But number two, is there anything that you want to do or that you should do to protect your work so that somebody like Gail couldn't just take it and then start charging people for it? Um, no, if they want to start charging, like, this is my own view of copyright and uh, licensing is if you want to take stuff that I wrote and make money from it, go ahead. I'm still going to be offering it for free. It doesn't damage me in any way. Um, but um, it'll be more tricky when we, when there's data available out there that's uh, licensed under more restrictive uh, licenses than we are than we would like um, and we've had to deal with that with the online critical pseudepigrapha as well we have some digitized texts that we just can't release yet they're ready to go but because of licensing we can't and um, so yeah we're not we refuse to uh, I mean, we're not going to to make things more public more open than than they were given to us. Um, so is that the kind of toes you're thinking of stepping on? Well, yeah, I think so. You know, there are certain licenses you can do, the sort of copy left licenses that say, this work is free and other people can use it as long as you guys don't start, start charging money for it, you know? And so there are yeah. all those sorts of, you know, MIT licenses and, um, you know, Creative Commons and copy left and all kinds of things that you can do, so. So yeah, ideally, I'd like to to make things uh, you know with the zero license CC zero, uh, like do whatever you want with this, I don't care. But the stuff that we're given doesn't come with such free licenses, and the stuff we're given, we're talking about two kinds of things here, right? We're talking about um, the software, like the source code. Um, uh, so if some of that's available for a certain license that we can actually use in our, our platform and adapt, um, that's great, but then that might restrict what kind of license we can make our platform available under. And the other is the data, the text data, um, what kind of license we're given to that and uh, what, what are the contributors 
more likely to contribute? Like what kind of license would be most attractive for contributors to work under? Yeah, that makes tons of sense. Yeah, and I, as somebody who's an advocate for open source stuff, um, <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And I just, I just understand how sticky it might be to go forward, you know, with a project like this and handle all of those licensing things. So I applaud your tenacity and your optimism to do that. So well done. Thanks. We'll go to Richard's question next. He's got his hand raised and then we'll go to two questions in the Q&A after that. Richard, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? I hope. Yes. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks, Ken. That was a great talk. Um, you and I were at Simon Fraser at the same time, but on, you know, in opposite places on campus. Um, I did meet a computer scientist while I was there. I gave him a ride up the hill one day. Uh, <laughs> that's, I that's used to hit take as, all the time. <laughs> that's as close as we would have come. Um, my question is is um, an editorial one, but it's I, th I think it's editorial anyway. Um, but I just wanted to follow up on something Harvey said that um, I, I really hadn't considered, uh, you know, your reference to it depends on the licenses of what you were given kind of thing. And uh, so that raises for me the concern, I guess, of could those gifts be taken back? So if, for example, you were to um, make the mistake, let's say, of moving too far towards the freedom that Harvey's advocating for. Um, could someone who has given you some texts to work with say, um, you know, you've you've um, offended us. We're going to revoke your ability to use our texts. Is that a possibility? Of course, it's a possibility. Do you think it's likely? Has that happened? I yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of where I was going with that question. Is is that kind of thing? at all likely I, I don't know i don't work with such texts so i don't know how um hands-on-y and hands hands off -y people who control those things are yeah i mean i have heard some some bad i have heard some stories um dead sea scrolls texts in particular where uh, the the data was or the the primary investigators wanted to keep the data under wraps and yeah, not make it publicly yeah. available um, because they were thinking in more conventional publication philosophy where, well, I mean, the whole scandal about the Dead Sea Scrolls being published back in the 90s. Uh, yeah, I remember that. That was, uh, you know, it was just academic jealousy and uh, <laughs> um, people not wanting to share what was yeah. their allotment of texts, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it does happen. Uh, but I'm thinking that the kind of people that are interested in cooperating with this project would not be likely to revoke. But if they do, okay. uh, if they do, they do. Right, great. Uh, um, so, so the question that I had uh, unprompted by Harvey was um, one that has to do with accessibility. And um, it, it, so I'm, I'm sort of thinking back to Laura's introduction of all the work you've done over the course of your career, which is a tremendous amount. I'm, I'm deadly envious. Um, you um, have, so you've moved essentially from the print era to, into the digital era. And I'm wondering if uh, the movement into the digital era has resulted in the production of any kind of controversies that might not have been generated had things stayed the way they were. So it's not the digit, it's not the move to the digital itself, but it's did the digital enable looking at texts in a new way that generated any controversies that you're aware of. I think if I think if you think of this sort of broadly under the under the hat of accessibility, it might help make sense of the question. I hope. Yeah, the only thing I can think of that is uh, the situations we've already mentioned of uh, the openness regarding right. texts. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, it, it's been controversial to, uh, to think that texts can be copied freely. And so I guess that like the whole publisher model, 
models that we've been used to of uh, needing to find a print publisher who will go through the editing process and invest the money to actually put this into physical copies and bind them and ship them all over the place that those that we don't depend no longer depend on those kinds of publishers to uh, to subsidize or, or fund our, our publication processes right yeah okay thanks um, to round us off, we'll turn to two questions from the Q&A. Uh, the first is from Janelle Janstad, who asks, I'm curious about the ultimate edition output. Will it be endings compliant, that is static HTML, CSS, and JS only? And are you offering hosting services? For those of you who don't know the endings project, I've put the URL into the chat. Okay. Uh, I should probably know more about the endings project. Uh, so I don't know how much of that I can answer. Uh, so this would be one of the things that I would want to include in, uh, in our interoperability. Uh, so that whatever uh, we produce is compatible with what, uh, what endings does. So I'll have to look into that. Um, and the second yeah. part is about hosting. Hosting. Are we offering hosting? We can do so because thread runs on what used to be compute canada's servers what are they called now the digital research alliance of canada yes or the alliance for short yes so we can host projects uh so actually maybe i'll put the screen up here of um, what our the thread website currently looks like Oops, where did I put it? Maximize, it's probably quite small, isn't it? Uh, so, thread. Oh, can I just make that a bit bigger at least? So yes, That's you can better. start a project here on the, the thread website. We have new project proposals. So I have to create the, the pro projects um, manually, but then once they're in, then you can log in and it will show up on your site. So there are a couple of uh, projects being hosted here. So we've got uh, uh, a pseudopigrapher one. We've got uh, who? Well, this is actually mine. Admin. Okay. Anyway, uh, so yes, we can host to some extent here. The problem will be if uh, images are needed to be hosted there, then we could run out of storage space, but texts are uh, very small, uh, don't have a large footprint. So we can support projects that whose images are um, held elsewhere, like on, uh, like the Vatican has through IIIF. Thanks. Um, and for our final question, as uh, I know that we've run a little bit late and some folks have had to go, uh, Matteo Sorenzo asks, uh, he says, I have a relatively large collection of manuscript facsimiles that I have partially transcribed and collated. Is it possible to get help to reconfigure an existing project like mine on thread? Yes. And I, I think you just sort of showed us that button that we should be uh, uh, looking at, <laughs> but go ahead. Uh... Right. So yeah, can you get some help? I, I, yeah, I'd love to see projects go. And especially I need to, I need to know what's working and what's not. And what better way to do that than to try something that uh, and see where it breaks. Great. How's that for taking uh, risks? I see another question in the chat too about synodic texts. Oh, yes. Joshua Young. Who uh, Josh is asking um, uh, about the absence of synodic text in this project and its vision of future development. There's a great deal of work in Japan, China, Korea, Singapore, and Europe on these same technologies and systems. Is this at all related to the questions you were just answering about rights and permissions? All right. So if we're talking about um, two things, is it, are we talking about soft the software tools? Or are we talking about the data? And if it's about software tools, I'm just not familiar what's uh, with what tools are being developed in uh, in Japan, China, Korea, uh, etc. Um, 
so this is where we need contributions. We need people to tell me what's going on and uh, you know what's working really well that we might want to look at and learn from or include. Uh, if it's about texts, uh, I guess the answer is very similar. Again, it's just an area that I'm not familiar with. I'm, uh, I'm trained in uh, ancient Near East stuff, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, Latin, and not so much in other languages. So uh, I'd love, to, I mean, the, the goal is to make it all uh, universal. So if a language can be encoded in uh, Unicode, it'll work. That's great. Um, and we've had a couple of folks expressing their interest in uh, taking you up on your invitation to join Thread and uh, test it and hopefully maybe break it sometimes and fix right. it. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, with that, I would like to uh, say thank you on behalf of everyone who was able to attend today to uh, Dr. Penner for this wonderful talk and Q&A session. Um, and I will send out an email to everyone once the uh, once this is uploaded to the Sane FX YouTube channel. But with that, thank you so much. Um.